Peace and blessings, and welcome back to the Heritage Hip Hop Podcast. This episode is brought to you by HeritageHipHop.com. We are more than music. To celebrate hip hop culture, we celebrate the fan, the artist, and the culture that we share by highlighting the, your future favorite artists today. So invest in them and invest in us by becoming members at HeritageHipHop.com and supporting the culture. We are more than music. We are God's heritage, and that heritage is hip-hop. This episode is also brought to you by Transparent Credit Repair, the superheroes of the financial literacy and credit repair world. Changing your financial future can happen in 15 seconds. All it takes is for you to believe that you can achieve more by fixing your credit. Open your wallet to more income instead of more debt by going to heritagehiphop.com and clicking on the link for transparent credit repair. Fill out the application and you will get 20% off of all services given by transparent credit repair. So be sure to go to heritagehiphop.com and click on the link for transparent credit repair. And that one decision can change your whole financial future. On this episode of the Heritage Hip Hop Podcast, we sit with a legend, one of my favorite acts from the past who's still doing it today at a high level shout out to special ed and his independent label semi ran by him artist directed but more importantly he's able to not only create his lane but to express himself the way he wants how does being an artist today reflect being one of the lords and the kings of yesterday and how is it better for him now how does he, how is he able to continue to inspire? Let us go to the interview and find out. And I will give you the rest of my commentary when this interview has finished. Peace and blessings and welcome back to Heritage Hip Hop, where we believe that we are more than music. We are God's heritage. And if God's heritage is hip hop, then it's our duty to bring you not only the truth, but to celebrate God through us and our heroes. And today I have somebody special on the line. Please introduce yourself to the people. Peace, y'all. It's special ed. Hey, man. It's a pleasure to get to talk to you as somebody who grew up listening to your music and who celebrates the sound and the culture and growth of hip-hop. So, once again, thank you for coming to Heritage Hip-Hop. Thank you for having me. So, tell me about... Well, people who don't know who special ed is, y'all could do y'all homework because it's about giving them the roses. It ain't about always rehashing the past, but let's talk about when you first came out in the game. You came out in the 80s. And um, a lot of people nowadays don't even know what 80s hip-hop is or was. Why don't you describe New York City in the 80s and what gra gravitated you towards hip-hop? New York City in the 80s is wow, a wow place. Um, pretty much what hip-hop did was Hip hop found a way to have an alternative to violence, a way to compete without being hurt, you know what I'm saying? A way to express one's level of skill or desirability or artistry. Hip hop helped people communicate, people that normally would not communicate help them communicate, whether it be by the words of the song or just connecting the listeners through harmonious vibration. And there I you like go. how you said I'm sorry, good. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. I like how you put that because harmony is one of the aspects of life that we take for granted when it comes to God and our culture, because harmony is not just our sound. It is not just how our bodies connect. It's also how we can move a crowd and move, make people move in unison to one sound. I want to ask you though, because as an MC in the game and you get a lot of love for being a 16 to 17 year old young man in the game, your pen was more advanced than people who did cadences from the 70s. So I want to ask you, as a, as a writer, when it came to hip-hop, in school, were you really proficient with writing and literature, or were you a math type of kid? 
No, I do it all type of kid. I could do anything as good as anybody. Okay. When we listen to the first two albums, right, you were very clear and you're very precise. And sometimes when people rhyme, they hit the beat at the at the break in a way where they're emphasizing their words to the point where they want punch. You as a lyricist, I want to ask you, what's more important to you when you create a song? Is it painting the picture and making the canvas for the um for the listener to appreciate, or is the punch of the bar that make them just nod their head and sit down and think about what you said? Nah, I go for a well rounded piece of art that will paint the picture and have them feel it. I mean, you have to really give it more than just a rhyme. True. And that's where hip-hop is lacking today. I'm going to flip-flop back and forth because in the past, it's from the 80s to like the mid-90s, there was a movement of edutainment consciousness and a message and today it's more get the bag make a hit and leave with the transition from that on a lyrical standpoint how are the listeners being cheated by not being able to appreciate hip-hop of then as opposed to now living through the hip-hop of the bag today well they still have the same hip hop exists. It's just not being focused on. It's not being appreciated or listened to because there's an agenda for us to destroy ourselves. And those positive messages are not a part of what they want us to listen to and uh, practice. So that's how it really goes. It's, it's up to you to still listen to the hip hop that you love and support because it's there. It's online. They just don't put it in your face because they really don't want you to be positive or strong. Yeah, today's society is showing us that in the recent election in Georgia where we had a mob of people actually storm the Senate building and police were actually taking pictures with the quote unquote Trump supporters, the Proud Boys, et cetera, instead of giving people the law and being strict to it like the other people of color. With that being said, what have you seen that made you give that answer about people not wanting you to hear the hip hop? What have you experienced that you've seen firsthand, not from only just radio play, but I mean, something that you experienced that not only will touch the mind, but even be unspoken truth to the people who actually know what you're saying or people who are going into the industry? Well, for one, you have to remember, hip-hop, everything is censored, even the Internet, even the, the social media. Everything is censored. So let's keep that in mind. Know that whatever you put out there is what they let you put out there. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. you know, just be just be careful in general. You know, so, so this is my thing. This is what I wanted to say. I wanted to say that when we first started and when hip-hop started, it was a message, yes. It was because it was about us reaching out and crying out for respect, for help, for love, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens is when you listen to these these vibrations, it does affect and change things. So they noticed how much it had an effect on people, and they took control of it and turned the messages around so that they could now preach a different message and affect people in a different way, which is negatively so basically now everything that's being promoted, marketed, pushed is destructive. I mean, you can listen to uh, 10,000 records, say, 
kill a nigga, kill a nigga, kill a nigga, kill a nigga. But the minute or the very second you say kill a dog or kill a gay person or kill a Jew or kill anything other than a nigga, you are going to have so much problems achieving any sort of success or even getting the light of day. Matter of fact, you're going to have protesters, death threats, etc. But you can say kill a nigga all day on the radio. Yeah. That has been the one change in hip-hop that I believe took us from the golden years to, to the corporate years of hip-hop. So I want to go back a little bit to the golden years. And I remember... The first time I heard I Got It Made. I Got It Made is going to be forever remembered as a legacy song. That's a certified classic song. The original and the business-like version remix. That song was the introduction to a movement of people who are considered young in age being proficient writers within the genre. When you first okay. made I Got It, I Got It Made, I want to ask you, how was it accepted by the people who came before you and did they appreciate what you created and made? Well, yeah, absolutely. I get nothing but love for that. And from all the OGs, everybody that I came up listening to, and rest in peace to ecstasy. And, um, you know, just in general, my OGs, I, I learned from all of them. So when they showed me that kind of love for what I contributed, you know, that's all I could ask for, you know, that, my idols appreciate my effort and my art. Yeah, I mean, for most people who look on the outside looking in, appreciation comes from sales. From people who are on the inside looking out, it's appreciation because you're setting the tone of something greater to come. And one of the songs that you made that I love, this is my favorite special ed song, actually is The Mission. And the mission showed not only do you write and do and are lyrical content wise, content wise, you could create a story. And the story rhyme is something that's been, I, I guess, m missing in hip hop in the last 20 years. They're starting to come back. What makes, right. what makes the story rhyme, in your opinion, just as fulfilling, if not more, than the braggadocious rhyme to a hot beat? Well, if it if it all ties in and makes sense, if the story has maybe a, a climax, some type of ending that's, you know, has meaning. You know what I mean? It's just having meaning within meaning. Any, any type of art that is appreciated just has deeper meaning. It's just not shallow art. It's something that is going to grab you and create and provoke thought. Mm -hmm. So the deeper the art, the more effective it's going to be on the recipient. Mm. You know why I always liked you as an artist? is because you remind me of the pure love of entertaining. My favorite beat that you rocked on in your catalog from back in the day, though, is um, come on, let's move it. The thing mm -hmm. about special ed was special ed could drop a jewel in a rhyme that had hit a jewel in that the end of the rhyme. I say, why well, say, and who is today? Because you you are who you make yourself today. That line right there was so beyond the people dancing that as you got older and you listened to it, you appreciated the jewel that was within it. Our jewel right. still. Are, are, are jewels the most underappreciated art of lyricism in hip hop? And if you think so, why? No, to the real listeners, that's what they appreciate about real hip hop. All the jewels that you drop in your lyricism. It's not just about words that rhyme. It's about how deep the meaning, once again, how thought provoking, how deep is the meaning, how you know, things have more than one meaning. Is it, you know, 
is, is how deep is it? Does it mean you could say one thing that means two, three things at the same time when you really think about what was said? You know mm-hmm. So language is a, it's a play on language. It's a way to still make it true and exact. So play with it. You know. Yeah, those entendres and those meanings are very serious when it comes to what makes somebody prolific as a part of what makes somebody memorable. You know what I'm saying? Because prolific means it just lives and lives and lives. When we do the history of special ed, we hear about Samuel J. Tilden and Erasmus Hill High School. And in those high schools, being that you were from Brooklyn or are from Brooklyn, there's famous names that have come from those schools who have become the leaders of thought within where the culture went. Let me ask you something. Who was the MC that pushed you and made you want to step your game up to outshine or even show them that you were on that level every time you you touched the microphone? I think that I was just on the quest to be the best. I was on the quest to be better than anybody that I've heard or was – hearing at the time i just wanted to be different innovative and kind of on another level of skill ability and um i think the artist that most kind of inspired me coming out would have been like jimmy spicer Mm. rest in peace Mm -hmm. you know um even uh houdini you know uh jalila ecstasy ecstasy rest in peace then we got um, Melly Mel, yeah. you know, Grandmaster Flash, Fear the Side. The message was a heavy-ass song for me because that's what showed me that it wasn't no, just about joking and gaming around on the mic. You could actually get serious and move somebody with your lyrics, you know what I'm saying, because that was all truth. It showed me the reality, the capability to have reality in your rap. Reality rap, I think, is more so what it was for me that, touch me like damn this shit real you know what i'm saying yeah you you, you know what those are you know curtis blow even even we going back like Mm -hmm. sugar hill gang i mean Mm -hmm. everybody of that era are the artists that i listened to as a youth and learned rap from and learned how to rap and set examples of what to rap about and and in that once again, it took us to rapping about positivity and, you know, strength and empowerment. And that's what I'm saying. That That's what we were patterned after. So when did the pattern change? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. True. True. Right. But I think, I think you changed some of that pattern when you first came out, though. Like, yeah, but like, see, my, I, I put the pattern in for, to the to the positive as far as the mindset. It was about empowerment and to take control and have mm-hmm. and not accept having, not having, and, and and doing it in a way more constructive than stealing and drug dealing. Right, right. Because I ain't promoting no drug dealing and robbery and stick-ups and all kind of shit. That's not my style. I never boosted, never shot lifted. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Actually, I got the cash, but money ain't nothing. Fuck that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I ain't, I ain't tripping over money. I make money. Money don't make me. You heard? Fact. So that's what it is. That was the mentality. I empower the youth to, to know that they can go out there and get it like I did. I had a whole bunch of teenagers and kids get up and get serious about life and their future and their careers and and the fact that they could be taken seriously it was a it was a move about youth empowerment Mm -hmm. and the empowerment of people not just youth alone but Mm -hmm. people on a whole but the youth especially was affected because i set an example and that it could be done Yes, you did. And that's why I want to give you your crown and your roses today. And I don't want you to have to wait to hear it. Because you always hear somebody say you're nice. You were good. You could rap. You know that already. 
But as somebody who studies hip hop, who appreciates it, and who is a fan to some to some degree, I want to tell you that there's a crown that you deserve that maybe you haven't heard yet. And if you did, well, then the Bible says in a witness of truth is of two is true. So let it be a truth that's told. What you did for my generation, because you came after LL, but you were kind of in that range, and you were signed younger than LL. So for my generation, when we saw you on Rap City or Video Music Box, and you were somebody that we was like, oh, he looked like somebody around the corner who's my age. Not only did you put the battery in our backs to get our words correct, you also showed us that hip-hop is not just for people out on the block to be fly. It's for our generation to take and to bring forward as well. So I want to give you your crown for that because if hip-hop is always going to be the voice of the youth and pushing it forward, we honor you because you were a youth who pushed it forward with us. And we were, like, ecstatic to know you were going on tour. We were ecstatic to know that you had songs coming out. And then, like, you had a video with Malcolm Jamal Warner, and the Cosby Show was big back then. So it was like Special Ed was the king of the youth that was coming into the game and actually making a lane that, since you, others have tried to follow and have not. Was that ever a burden on you as you did your thing in the game? Nah, man. What was the burden was being respected as a minority and as a youth and getting my just dues from corporate America and um, getting the money that I was owed and due. It's like, you know, they just never want to pay nobody. They just think right. that everybody's going to lay down and say okay or lay down and die. And I'm still here. You know what I'm what, saying? That's the what, point. Point what did they try to do to you? Multiply. I mean, not pay me. The same thing yeah. they try to do to everybody. You can ask anybody. Ask Run DMC. They was on the same label. Ask them if they were paid for their work. <laughs> you understand? Right. Ask anybody. In, th in that era, you were tied into corruption. I mean, it's still corruption, but it's digitally tracked now. So it's, uh, you know, it's done differently. But back then, it was just blatant disrespect and corruption. And we was all subject to it. And there was not much you could do. You know, they were their own, they had their own distribution, their own manufacturers, their own labels. They had, they controlled everything in and out. So, you know, they could tell you anything. And that's what they did. They told us anything and they handled us anyway. And then they lost us. That's why. That's, that's how that worked. You know what I'm saying? You got, you get something good and you don't appreciate it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to ask you this, because we all know the game has, is very dirty, because some of the contracts people were signing back then are the same contracts that they were signing back when James Brown and them were out. It's the same contracts that they even try to push in the 360 deal, and that's complete robbery and ownership of what you create. Since you've had a contract in music back in the day, as a veteran artist, how have they subverted your pockets by going digital now? Because your contract didn't include digital recording. So how does that affect you now when people stream your music? Let me tell you how it affects me now. I get paid now because it didn't affect digital, so that therefore they don't control anything digital. I do. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, why a lot of people say they can't find this off on online, they can't find that online, they can't find this online because they can't put it online because they know they don't have the legal right to. And the minute they do, I'm at them. I'm going to do it myself either way, but you know what I'm saying? I ain't worried about nothing. I ain't worried about nothing. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because... I'm like I said, as a hero life. of ours. I'm enjoying my life. See, I'm not caught up in the whole the whole cipher of problems surrounding this shit. I take this shit with a grain of salt. I'm going to get everything that's meant for me out of it. And I don't have to run to go get it. As you should. And it's yours already. Salute to you. <laughs> right. You know? So I just chill. I just chill, maintain, do what I do. And, you know, my shit comes to me. And I, I, I go seek it one step at a time. Ain't no rush. 
Everything that's meant for me will be for me. Okay. You know what? You know what made me. You know what made me happy about your career as somebody who watched you for years. And I want to give a shout out to my cousin, the Griffins and the Browns, because being a youth in, in the hip hop, you know, I followed behind my brother, and they introduced me to the new sounds. So that's how I got to hear you. And one of the things that made me proud to to, to really know your voice and your style was when the Crooklyn Dodgers came out. And when oh, that yeah. came out, once again, you were in the forefront of a classic. That will live on forever. Right. I wanna, was, was the Crooklyn Dodgers, was it supposed to be a project or was it only supposed to be one song? Well, the Crooklyn Dodgers and the Crooklyn Project was a soundtrack to the movie. Right. And that's really all that it was, was a, a soundtrack song to the movie. And actually, on that soundtrack, it was the only current song because the rest of the soundtrack was all like songs from the 70s. Right. So, really, it was just a soundtrack, but I think the momentum, the energy, and the idea took a life of its own, and it turned into uh, the spirit of the Crooklyn Dodgers. And Spike had that vision of the Crooklyn Dodgers with doing it in the first place. So, I think that that energy kind of, um, kind of, Spilled over now everyone else, and um, I think the the Crooklyn, that's how come they did a number two. You know what I mean? And I don't even know. Was there a Crooklyn two, or did they just do? No, nah, uh, they just redid the song. That song was for Clockers. See, what, that's what I'm trying to tell you. So basically, it took on such a life of its own that they made another one. And um, at the time, though, a lot of people expected an album. And I don't think um, the label ever really made any aggressive effort to do it because I think we were all kind of like, okay, well, we here, let's go. Yeah. And, uh, just waiting for nothing, really, you know? Yeah, I mean, the fans really um, were cheated because even a part three came out. When Premier didn't touch it, it was Ninth Wonder, Memphis Bleak, Gene Gray, and some other folks from Brooklyn who did it. And we were like, oh, we're going to get the Brooklyn know. soundtrack. Oh, you didn't know about that one? I had no one? idea. I had no idea that even existed. Yeah, it's a, it's a Brooklyn 3. Because I like those artists. And if yeah, I knew, I'm gonna look, I would have been aware. I'd have been supportive I'm of it. Look it up right now so I can give you the yeah. information. I'd have been um, supportive that, of it. I'd have been playing it. And we could have included it in our trilogy or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Cooking is a, that's a, a, you know, that's our claim to fame. So I would yeah, definitely was... welcome and honor any more Brooklyn Dodgers. It was, it was called Brooklyn in My Mind. Darian Brockington, Knife Wonder, Memphis Bleak, Jean Grey, and Most Death. Oh, for real? Yeah, that came out in 2007. Oh. And all I right? ain't know? Nah. How well, people be doing all kind of Brooklyn shit and I don't know, man? That shit don't <laughs> even fly right. It don't even sound right, really. It's all right, well, though. You know what I'm saying? Everybody got to fly a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Everybody got to fly. Yeah, I mean, it's a tribute to y'all, because at the end of the day, yeah, but I don't people even know are doing it. That's what I'm saying. If, if, could I know? Could I could could I know? Could, like, somebody tell me? Well, bring it to my well, attention. Tag me. I know they well, have social media. A first for Heritage Hip Hop. We were the first to break Cooklin 3 to Special Ed. The originator, one of the originators of the Cooklin movement, period. Give that man some respect. You know what I'm saying? But, that's what it says? Huh? That's what it say? That's what I said. <laughs> oh, copy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it should say. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you this, though, because the Crooklyn Dodgers movement actually is what created another movement in hip-hop that you need a crown for. That was one of, like, everybody always has come together to do songs, right? Uh-huh. But y'all were the creators of the Borough Track movement. Because we didn't have a Brooklyn come together song before. We didn't have, like, like the QB Finest. That wasn't right. really a track. It was a collective album that 
I guess people did or did not mess with. But the Crooklyn Dodgers was a song that grew into something that was a, a, a dream of an expectation for others. Right. And, e- and even today, now we got Drake and Future doing albums together. We have everybody loves Red and Meth doing albums together. And people love like um Jericho Jackson. We got Crisis and Elzai. But that one song actually sparked the revolution of the collab song. If we had the rules back then when you were in, in the game heavier to now, and you had that same freedom. Is there anybody you would have collabed with that you didn't, or you did, and you want, want to make a whole album with them? Man, that's an interesting question. I think there's a lot of artists that I would collaborate with, and and when when you start collaborating, you don't know what's gonna happen because you could make um, a bunch of songs. You know, you you could sit in the studio and make a few songs at once. So mm-hmm. I think I'd have been working with a lot of people, man. And that's the thing, like, back then we were, I don't know, it was a different climate, so everyone didn't collaborate as freely, you know what I mean? Right. And it was it was a friendly competition. It was a competition nonetheless, but it was more so like we shined on our own. We were all individual um, stars, you know what I'm saying? And we had our own, we held our own weight, and that's kind of how it was. I think we got more into working together once certain collabs started coming out and, um, you know, it, it was successful, and it just showed that artists from different labels could come together and work and do songs together. Because that was po- polit- political too. Because I know there was some t- times you wanted to work with certain artists, and just because of the labels, you know, it wasn't possible. Yeah, the mixtape game subverted them, and I think that was a fear of the of the labels. Is that like today? Now the artists especially by having them, their own movements. Now y'all are the controlling the narrative and they're fighting to get into your pockets where now you can close your pocket off to them and make your own money. Mm-hmm. You know? Exactly. You could go straight from your house to the marketplace. You don't need a label. You don't need to make a stop anywhere. And you don't need to ask anyone if you can put your music out. Right. And I think that helped even spur even you and your own label, shout out to Semi, that yeah. you you have collaborations with the Dog Pound, and them songs are hot. Yeah, you know, I love this is I love those records. Yeah, I do too. That I think that's one of my favorite albums, just due to the um the hands on and the freedom that I had. I was free from a label. I was independent. I was making music that I love with the people that I love, and I wanted to make music with. And that's the kind of career that I want. I want to be able to do the shit I want to do. You know what I mean? Like work with the people that I fuck with for real, you know, and and, and show that side of the, the craft. Like I'm I'm from Brooklyn, New York, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time now, I go to South Side Chicago and politics. You know what I'm saying? I go to Compton. So I go to Watts. I go to all hoods, all over. I go to Philly. I go to all sides of Philly, any side of Philly. You know what I'm saying? I go everywhere. I go all over the world. And I I, I gravitate to my people. I gravitate to the hood. That's how I get that energy. And that's how I get the love that I get. You know what I'm saying? Because I give it back. And that's what a lot of artists got to kind of learn to do, is learn to be more human and mm-hmm. less Hollywood, less plastic, and just more human. That's all the people want, man. All the people want is you to be you. They don't want you to act like some phony, fake-ass Instagram clown. You feel me? (laughs) They want you to be who you are. They want to see your life and and the the shit you go through, the real shit, struggles, and the reality that make you real. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of people is, is, is living on a whole nother notion they living for tv they doing it for the gram and you know what i'm saying that's why they end up in the situations they end up in because of the focus and the lack of focus i feel that but let's take this interview to another level because west indian culture is celebrated now more than it was then because it was a secret to people who weren't in the city or from the city so we everybody always gives Cool Herc the respect of 
making the movement of hip hop begin to jam, but they never talk about his West Indian roots. And the and the roots of the West Indies are just as interwoven into hip hop as just when you say Brooklyn, Queens, Mad, and the Bronx. The West Indies has its finger all in that pot, and it helped cook the sound. How does West Indian culture make hip hop richer than what people understand of it today? Well, it's a deeper vibration because they're telling a deeper story as well, a part of the same struggle and connecting it. You know what I mean? And um, they have their own uh, revolutions and revelations to share. And um, I think just the culture and the vibe, the vibrations, the the, the sounds that they emit is um, pleasing to the world. I think it, it, it's tranquil, it soothes. In addition to, you know, they have, you know, music for war, too. So yeah. it's just about the vibrations that they send out. But in terms of its relation to hip-hop um, and Cool Herc and all that stuff, he basically brought the whole um, sound outside feel to the Bronx, I, I guess is what it is. You know, the same way they bring out the scent in Jamaica and play outside is the same thing he did. He brought the music outside to the people which is one of the ways that they found, you know, to help and bring people together and bring some unity and cohesion in the community when there's uproar and, and um, tr trouble, turmoil, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes that help, and that's been, you know, the case in Jamaica. So here in America, Hurt was doing that, you know, in that time frame when it was unrest and uncertainty and um you know, it brought a lot of people outside together and at peace. And now they competed in arts instead of war, instead of killing. You understand? Yeah. And I love that mm -hmm. because the one vibration that hip-hop gives that nobody can deny is truth. And I think one song where you really told your truth was NYC. And Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love that mm -hmm. song. And, um... That goes into not only your storytelling, but it went into your depth to show that there's your truth and there's the truth, and they could both align. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so many people now are open to telling the truth and being vulnerable instead of hiding their truth and just being an, a, a quote-unquote artist? Well, because the truth is what people want. I mean, uh, the truth is what people want to hear. They they don't want to just hear made up stuff all the time. They want to hear about you, about your life, about what you've been through, like I was saying before. So when you touch on that, they really connect on a more personal level with the artist. The other stuff that's unbelievable, they can't really connect to. Mm. Let, the truth, let the truth be told. Special Ed is more than an MC. He's also a producer. Tell us about your chops on the boards and how putting beats together has helped real make you even more in love or well-rounded in the culture. Well, production is something I picked up from Hitman Howie T. I owe it all, 100%, to Hitman Howie T for showing me the light and the truth in terms of production. The whole time he was doing my album, I was studying the craft. I knew how he made beats. I knew he was a DJ and producer. He made a, a lot of records in the in, in the hood for for artists: UTFO, Chub Rock, Little Sean, Puma, um, Whistle, you name it. Roxanne, the real Roxanne, rather. Mm -hmm. So basically, he was the man. So I went to him, and when he agreed to record me, I was ecstatic. Like, yeah, I right, this it, we on. And as we were recording and going through the process of sampling and looping and creating tracks i was paid attention so the time i got my first check i went to one of them stores sam ash guitar center i don't want to promote neither one but um and and i bought equipment just so i could follow in his footsteps because i admired him and what he did I love music that much that I said, the man, this is it. This is great. And this is what I need so I can do my thing. 
I can flow, I can record, I can do stuff too. Because Howie did it all in his home. Mm -hmm. So once again, I followed the footsteps of the great hitman Howie T. If he could do it in his crib, surely I could. He taught, you know, I'm, I'm following my teacher. So basically, I got me a little set up and started producing immediately. So by 1990, I'm producing. Mm. And that went on and on until I started to not just want to produce for myself, but produce for other people. But I, the way I produce is in such a way, whereas I don't like to just submit stuff to people and hope to get placements. I like to work with artists that I know and that I want to work with. So that's what I did. I worked with people that I actually knew that I was cool with, that we had a vibe of communication. And that's how I did my, that's how I just, you know, live my life according to what my life was real, you know, real life. So the people around me that I worked with were people in my life, you know what I'm saying? And um, that's how I went. And um, we've got to work with some great people and um, do some great things over the last 30 years. I like that story. Thank you very much. But I want to ask you this. As a producer, since you were crafting your own tracks, did producing make you a better MC? Um, I don't know if it makes you a better MC, but it definitely makes you a better producer. Hmm. Um, okay. As an MC, writing is one thing. Your writing skill, your thought process is what it is. Um, as a producer, how it could help and how I can see it helping is as far as um, flows. You know, you may tend to play around more with flows and, the, you know, the way the music is sequenced or the style of the track. Or, you know, you just get into maybe different flows as you produce and, and kind of chop things up. Because producing is about, you know, a lot, but part of it is chopping up sounds. And kind of that goes in with the lyrics. You learn to kind of, you know, do different patterns, different flows according to the beat and the rhythms that you're uh, spitting to. So, yeah, it'll help in that way. I mean, you know, you can play around more. I think as a producer, you would play more with your lyrics. Okay. You know what I'm you know, and just Let's test play. it out with music. Let's play a game. What is your favorite beat that you re they recorded yourself to? Or what's the, your favorite beat that you let somebody else record to that you gave away or sold? Man. Man, man, that's a hard one. Uh, favorite? Shit. I don't know, man. Um, <laughs> shit. Yeah, you, you got me on that one, buddy. Because I'd have to go into, you're talking about catalog, and, and mm -hmm. the catalog it goes into even mad unreleased, like mad unreleased material. So I got a lot of stuff that's still to be yet to be heard. And that's a part of what I'm doing right now. You know, I'm going to go ahead with the new uh, digital age and go ahead and put it out there and release some things that, Makes sense. We were working on a lot of music, doing a lot of things uh, at the Dollar Cab Lab, and I intend on making good on all that. You know, as you should. Great stuff. It's some prophecy. It's a lot of prophecy in there. I promise yeah. you that. When I when okay. I release this stuff, it's gonna be like damn, because this stuff is like over twenty years old. Like some of it twenty five years old. So it's like the things that are being said and the names and the depictions and shit like that. Shit is crazy. Watch when watch when I drop my this shit here. Shit okay. Crazy. Yeah. One Shout of one of my favorite tracks you produce. Oh, sorry. One of my favorite tracks you produced was strictly for my niggas. Yeah. That 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 was one of the most meaningful. I'm a, I, I always call myself the original Pac fan in Jersey because everybody wanted to be all on Pac at, at death row. My favorite Pac song back in the days when my homies called. So I had the the Tupacalypse album I had strictly for my niggas. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I remember when I heard that beat, Pac was actually pushed to do another rhyme flow. You know what I'm saying? Right. And right. I know he's not big on hooks, but he's strictly for my, strictly for my, strictly for my niggas. You know what I'm saying? Pac had mm -hmm. to actually change how he attacked the song. Were you there when he recorded it? Absolutely. We was okay. there with all 
processes of all the songs that we were involved in with every artist. Everything was hands-on for me, man. Those were people that I actually, like, really, you know, were friends with and, and got down with. That's how we even got to the energy and synergy of creating music together. Like I said, it was never a shot in the dark. I don't submit, you know, tracks to labels. Right. You know okay. So, yeah. So, so yeah. And that was um, DJ Action. DJ Action was the main conspirator. He the co-defendant on that track right there. So, okay. so um, DJ Act really uh, was instrumental on that track right there. And um, we definitely laced it up, though. You know, I'm always hands-on and involved in everything we do. Okay, so I want to ask you this. This would be my final question as a producer as we wind down. My final production question to you is this. What is the face that a person makes when they know they got a hit from Special Ed? Because I know everybody reacts to a hot beat differently. How do you know, or what is the face they make that makes you be like, yeah, I got them, <laughs> this the one? Yeah, you know, it's that face. Either like you just ate a whole lemon, okay. and you get and you getting over it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or the face like you just seen a ghost. Ooh, it's one of them okay. two faces. I'm feeling that. So with that being said, you are a well-rounded artist. Pin game, nice. For everybody who doesn't know about Special Less Game, look, go get the albums. Go look at the videos. Do your homework, you know what I'm saying? We're giving roses to somebody in the crown, to somebody who not only earned it, but he's inspired others to achieve theirs. I want to ask you this. Now that the digital age is coming up, I know you have new music coming out. And there's a song that I was given called Rap Zone. Where are you right. going with the new music? And how are you attacking the game differently now that you're in charge with your own label and have the digital age at your disposal? Well, for one... Uh, Rap Zone was a dedication project for Steezo, rest in peace, who we lost this year. Okay. And um, Steezo was actually recording, and um, we finished up the album for him. And a lot of artists jumped in and um, finished the project. It's called The Last Dance. Steezo was a dancer for EPMD originally, and then went on to his own thing, making records. But um, that record is for Steezo's album, and it's called Rap Zone, and it features me and Tash from the Licks. And um, that was one there. So I've been doing a lot of features in the meantime, in between time. What it is is, for me, my, my, my overview of this whole thing is if I'm going to do my own project, it has to be on the level that I see myself and the level that, I should be at when I'm doing records and music. If it's not, I'm good. I'll wait. However, I do have loved ones that are still in the fight and in the effort and the struggle, and they have projects. So I often feature all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. It's no secret. You know, I still spit all the time. So you'll hear songs. There will be artists with projects. East Coast, West Coast, down South, overseas, different countries that I'll feature on. So, you know, you you look and ye shall find. You know what I'm saying? I do the do, the one, two. But as far as special ed on my own, as far as special ed is concerned, it would have to have the magnitude that I want to see for me to even involve myself at this point. You know what I'm saying? Because it's so easy to just put out a record tonight. I could, you could put out a song tonight if you want to, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, is it going to be heard? Is it going to be uh, marketed properly? Are people going to know it exists? Are you going to monetize it? That's my main concern. So when all those factors come into play and everything is aligned correctly, mm-hmm. then I'll perhaps continue, you know, some special ed stuff. But in the meantime, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, good. I'm good. I promise you, I've always been good. You know what I'm saying? I just watch. <laughs> I just watch. I, I like to see what's going on. It's, it's, you know, entertaining at times. Okay. 
Yeah. You got one more song called God Don't Like Ugly. You want to touch on that? Yeah, God Don't Like Ugly. That's another collab I did with one of my West Coast homies from the Bay, the Yay area. That's my man Tino, Straight Away Entertainment. Shout outs to Tino. And um, basically, I was out there doing a show, getting a haircut, and um, he was like, yo, we're doing a video for one of the joints on the album. So I was like, yo, what about our joint? And he was like, man, I ain't, you know, you tell me. So I was like, shit, I'm here now. Let's do it. So I, I was in the barber chair. So I got my cut, and we went down the street. It happened to feature Dell, and he was home. <laughs> <laughs> so we shot that video for that, too. So if y'all go to YouTube, God Don't Like Ugly, featuring Special Ed and Dell. It's Tino, T-N-O, featuring Special Ed and Dell. And that, that right there now, that song is, um, well, everything has substance. But this one in particular I wanted to get on because of the subject matter. Mm-hmm. I feel like sometimes we got to remind ourselves, you know, we have to humble ourselves, you know what I'm saying, and have some perspective or respect for the universe. So with that being said, I, I heard the song and I was all in. And Tino's my guy. We've done songs before. You know, I got a special love for the West Coast. Shout out to Matt Dre, rest in peace. Mm-hmm. To the boss, you know what I'm saying, and um, the, it goes on. The legacy goes on, and these are people that come up in the era in the game. They know respect. They show love. You know what I'm saying. It's about real values and real morals. So that's why I rocks with people. Like, yeah, shout out to Whole Thiz Entertainment. You know, everything, man. Like, it's real. We just we we. See, the media says one thing, but we say something else. Mm -hmm. And until you start listening to us, you're not going to really know what the truth is. All right? So I've been going back and forth, traveling around for 30 years, and we all got, I got, we all got uh, got synergy. We got love. We make music together. We hang out together. We do everything. We party together. Me and everybody. And I'm talking about all, everybody. I mean, it's always been a a constant party. You feel me? A constant money, a constant money making party. Not just a party, but a money making party. So at the end of the day, you know, you can believe what you want, but the truth is that we all people out here with families, with parents, with kids, and we making a living and we providing uh, a way for others to make a living. And y'all have to respect that and the business of it and stop getting caught up in the emotions of, you know, false images. You know, y'all letting too much falsification control y'all mentally and emotionally to where y'all acting poorly. Y'all acting very poorly over foolishness over bullshit and basically the smaller commissions. <laughs> Y'all acting crazy over the peanuts. Y'all tripping while they out here getting the lion's share laughing at y'all scrapping in the cage. So with yeah, that think being about said, that. Let's, yeah. be, let's be truthful to each other and let's Let's take care of each other in our culture for what it is. Amen. Please, please Amen. drop your social media so people know how to find you, find your music, and invest in your music. Uh, my social media, my IG, and most of my stuff is all special ed music. On the look for me anywhere, it'll be just special ed music. And on Twitter, it'll be just special ed. So, I, you know, you'll find me and you'll know if it's me. If I done said some wild shit or some dumb shit, because I don't really use it for its intent and purpose because I'm not a, a lab rat. You know what I'm saying? A guinea pig of no sort. You know what I'm saying? I use the phone for communication to my loved ones and to let people know I'm alive. 
but I ain't about to be part of no study. I ain't about to get no fingerprint, retinal scan, facial recognition, none of that shit. I'm going to press the button and talk, and then I'm going to hang up on your ass. <laughs> with that being said, everybody, before we go, I want to say, Special Ed is a, he's a landmark in hip-hop. This is not somebody that you hear was like, yeah, oh, yeah, he was out. Special Ed is a landmark where that when that plant, when that flag was planted, something new came from him, and we always have to honor. So it was a pleasure for me to inter interview you, give you your roses, and also help, um, give you your crown that you deserve. And if he has music that you like, everybody, please don't just reminisce and dance to I Got It Made, or just don't stream the song NYC. Heritage Hip Hop does not believe in streaming. We believe in investing, so we ask that you purchase your music, because guess what? In Donald Trump's After America, with all this crap going on in this country, if they ever cut the internet off and you don't purchase your music, you don't own your music. So please, invest in the artist and invest in yourself by buying good music. You agree, sir? Amen. Amen to that. And all buy right. direct from the artist. You know, there buy you go. direct from the artist. Support the artist. If the artist is on a label that, you, you know, they may not be getting their just dues, buy, buy some merch. Buy something directly from the artist so you feed their families. Facts. Facts. Before we go, I like to play a game with my guests called the Rapid Fire Questions. Would you like to play this game with me? I, I don't play no games, but I, I fuck with you. Go ahead. All right. Here we go. The Rapid Fire Questions are not yes, no questions. These are questions that for you I've changed. They will celebrate you as an artist. Also, show everybody your depth of hip-hop knowledge. So the first question um that I have to ask you is this. What is the most important hip-hop song that changed your life? The Message. All right. Shout out to Grandmaster Fast, Flash. And, 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 and Super Rhyme. Super Rhyme. I got to okay. have Super. It's a double. That's a double whammy. Okay. Super Rhyme. Yeah. Question number two. Being a staple in hip-hop means that you get appreciated in ways that keep you relevant to all eyes, not just all ears. How special was it for you with Rick Ross when you in that video and have you spit a verse on the remix? Man, it was a it was a it was a privilege and an honor, man. Like imitation is the highest form of flattery, man. So I mean Ross always kept it real with me even before he came out as a you know the Miami I used to live out there too and you know, the way the brother approached me and, uh, you know, I respect that as a grown ass man. So, you know, Ross always good with me. And when he wanted to do the record, actually I found out after he did it, but I had moved. And uh, when I reached out to him, he was like, yeah, whoop, 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 you're the record. And he was like, yo, jump on the remix or whatever. So that's the kind of guy he is, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's all love. So I respect, but like I said, man, imitation is the highest form of flattery. Him just wanting to do that. Is showing me the type of respect that he has for me or the type of love that he has for me and my craft. And, and not just Ross, it's a lot of artists. It was all love. And I think that, like I said, uh, just the fact that he wanted to do, that wanted to do it, that honored my, my, my energy and vibration to where he wanted to participate in it. You know, I don't think that people copy your stuff. I think that they, the emulation is participation. I think they want to share in that energy, share in that vibration in that moment with you. So that's why they they recite. That's why they emulate and, and say things that are similar. So it's an honor for me when people do that. I don't never trip and be like, I've never sued an artist. Now, if you're a record label or a company you're trying to shit on me, hell yeah, I'm going to get at you two times. But artists, trying to do it, trying to eat. It's like me. I've sampled artists. They've never came at me. I mean, yeah. I've had to clear samples, yes, but I'm talking about hip-hop artists that I sample. I'm talking about Flavor Flav, Big Daddy Kane, Salt and Pepper, uh, you know, on and on, Rakim. I've sampled everybody that, and the reason that I sample them is because I love them. Mm -hmm. I share in their vibration. I share in their energy, and I and I love the message. There's a, I, 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 when, when somebody can be inspired by even a portion of your words and 
develop that into a whole new life. That's that's life right there. You yeah. feel me? Yep. Yeah. Fact. So this is my next question. As an MC, I gotta ask you this: What is the perfect hip hop beat? Meaning, if that person didn't come out with the beat, it would have been your single. Oh, a lot of shit, man. I'll take everybody beat. I'm going to still take everybody beat. Okay. Because it's okay. all music. It's all music. You know, back all in right. the days when you jack somebody beat, they'd be like, ah, oh, you done, you jacked him. But now it's cool. It's like, it's a, you know, it's like a mixtape type of feel. But I love yeah. beats. And I think there's been a lot of beats from uh, throughout the ages. Plenty of mm -hmm. artists have had beats that I was like, oh, I'd have killed that. Plenty, mm -hmm. many artists. So hell yeah, that should happen all day, man. We be, that's a whole nother interview. <laughs> okay. Well, come back and do it. You know, the doors always open. You know that? That's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm a I'm a fan. I'm a fan of music. Like, even though I don't record like publicly or I don't put out music right now, I still listen to it. I still listen to the new music that artists are putting out. The young artists. Mm -hmm. I listen to all genres. It's not just hip hop. Hip hop mm -hmm. is not my whole life. You know what I'm saying? Hip hop is just an industry and a part of my life. Right. You know what I'm saying? But I, you know, I appreciate a lot of artists and a lot of new artists too. And I just want to tell y'all, y'all, keeping music alive. So keep on doing it. Don't stop. Mm -hmm. I don't care what nobody say. I don't care about no criticism what people want to say about your style of music. Just be accountable for what you say. All right. Be accountable so for I, your act. That's all. I got two I got two last questions. And then yeah. we're gonna move we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna close out. My our second oh thank you for everybody listening to Hell Richard Chip Hop Podcast. You can catch this um interview on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, YouTube, whatever you stream, but no matter what you do Always support us because we are more than music. We are God's heritage, and that heritage is hip-hop. So the last two questions I'm going to ask you, the first one is this. I always said that, as you said, imitation is a form of flattery and people um, taking what you started and then giving you honor by continuing it. What artists have you seen throughout the ages and years of hip-hop do you think followed your lead and did it the correct way while establishing their own lane? But a whole lot of them, man. I mean, shit. There's generations of artists right now. There's artists right now that's following that don't even know who they following. They they think they following somebody else. <laughs> so you just got to look and, and, and be filled with joy. You can't even want – I don't even want credit to everybody, nobody's shit. I just want the the peace in knowing that I was able to in some way help somebody come up you know that's my whole thing like not even in just music my songs made people get up and come up in all industries in life it made them want to attain and achieve more in every aspect of life so it wasn't just about rap music it was about humanity it's about mm. people you know what i'm saying mm. it's about mm -hmm. getting up and getting more well, I hope you would like this interview because as a person who got to talk to an MC Respect, I really wanted to give you one of the best interviews that you can have. So I humble myself to say, once again, thank you for letting me do this, and I, and I, I hope it, it met your standard. Oh, I appreciate it, man. It was a great interview, man. Very insightful questions, man. A lot of times people just want to know very specific, like, you know, this, that, and the third. When, when, when you have, you know, more deeper questions or meaning behind the questions, you know, that's what I like. I like to talk about the what things mean or what meaning things have. You know what I mean? Okay. Thank you very much. The Thank last you. question I'm I'm gonna build up though. 'Cause this is this is this is me getting to actually talk to somebody who I saw on T V that I always wanted to see and actually say thank you to. I got it made was the beginning for a lot of people to fall in love with your style and your music. I, myself, fell into Come On, Let's Move It first because as a kid who saw people breakdance, 
That was the illest breakdance battle I ever saw on Video Music Box to that beat. And I'm like, damn, that's special, eh? Nah. And I had to go listen to the song. And then, right. and then when I heard I'm on, I'm on the mission, I was like, nah, see, I'm like, y'all, y'all, y'all not showing me something. There's something else here. So ever since I got it made and the mission and come on, let's move it. And I never go back to NYC, the Crooklyn Dodgers. There's a legacy of appreciation that not only you gave me, but you gave people around the world. So my most important question and the last question to your first interview, because you can always come back to Heritage Hip Hop, is this. What is the legacy you leave behind that changed the world for the better because Special Ed did music? Oh, empowerment and believing in yourself. You know, believing in the power that you possess and your abilities and never doubt yourself, just strength. My message is empowerment. You could do it. You could go get it. Ain't nothing stopping you. I brainwashed them into doing better. Mm. They got mind control trying to fuck us up. I'm mind controlling you to do better. Mm. There's, there's one MC who followed your path that I would really like to introduce you to. And his name is Lao Omalau. He was part of Negros Americanos. He followed your path. And what you said is exactly what he does today. So I want to salute Lao Omalau for even telling me how he does his thing. And for you to echo that as an OG will be meaningful to him. And especially I want to honor you as a dad because you talk about the responsibility that you have to your children with the music you create and the influences you want to give. And that's what you said in your last, in your answer. So salute to you, sir. And thank you very much. Amen. Salute. So everybody out there listening, this is Karev from Heritage Hip Hop with one of the God MCs himself, Special Ed, and we say peace, and we out. Peace. Special Ed will always be remembered as somebody who came to the mic earnestly and honestly and never gave up his willingness to drop jewels and give lyrics with meaning. For that, he is a crown king when it comes to hip hop and it is a pleasure and a blessing for us to serve the king of crown and appreciation so shout out to special ed make sure you go purchase his music new music coming and support our ogs man especially those who stand for the culture for real and not about shucking jiving and tap dancing for people just to make a buck this episode of the Heritage Hip Hop Podcast is brought to you by Transparent Credit Repair, the superheroes of the financial literacy and credit repair world. Go to HeritageHipHop.com right now or click on the link for Transparent Credit Repair and receive 20% off of all services given. Change your financial future with one decision. All it takes is for you to go to HeritageHipHop.com and click on the link for Transparent Credit Repair to open your wallets up to receive more income instead of paying out more debt. For everybody out there listening, we thank you for coming on this journey with us to build Heritage Hip Hop as one of the premier foundations of not only New Jersey hip hop, but of the hip hop culture worldwide. We ask that you become members of our website, www.heritagehiphop.com. Membership is free and you can receive some free music and playlists and things like that from us to celebrate these new up and coming independent artists from the United States and around the world. On HeritageHipHop.com, we believe we are more than music. So we offer you talk shows like The Mic Council, which is a show in which we talk about things like the Corona vaccine, which is coming to a theater near you. And we talk to a doctor on the website about that. Please check out our talk show, The Mic Council, on HeritageHipHop.com. You can follow us by subscribing to our YouTube page, Heritage Hip Hop on YouTube. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe hit the notification bell to the channel so you're notified when all new interviews and podcasts drop you can also follow us on instagram twitter linkedin tumblr we have spotify apple music and itunes podcast as well so we are wherever you stream and receive your hip-hop information shout out to the people who help makes this thing possible transparent credit repair the Goodfellas, one of our networks, you can see me on their show. The recap featuring the Goodfellas on Facebook and YouTube. 
you can follow us there as we build up our networks and believe in working together and not separate. Shout out to Fire Jaws, Lex Diamonds, Big A, Tommy Guns, Dev. Shout out to Shaw Montana. Shout out to Fatty's Place, my man BQ, always supporting and making sure that the platform looks good and builds in the right way. Shout out to the Build Better Brands family and shout out to the people who have helped take us to the next level. MJ of Hip Hop, MJ's Hip Hop Connects. Check out if you're looking for a publisher. She's one of the best, if not the best in the game. Shout out to our Fleet DJ family and our Heat DJ family. Heritage Hip Hop is out there and we ain't going nowhere because we stand for you and we stand for the culture. Shout out to Indeligible Conscious, Funky Cuz out there in the UK. So for everybody out there that's listening, support our other station, A Squad Rebel Radio, Grumpy's World, and the 420 Bali Hour, and support real hip hop. And with that being said, we say peace and we out.